So I'm 10 years old, and like every other girl, I loved going to school. But I also liked missing school one day or two. I remember the first day I received a notification from my teacher saying that we wouldn't have classes the next day. And then the next day, I received another notification with one more day without classes. But then one day became one week. And one week became one month. In one month, a couple of months. And then the entire school year had to be readjusted for the amount of classes we were missing. Don't think I was on vacation mode during that time, no. I would be walking down the streets with a little pot my mom gave me and that I would use as a drum to go perfectly well with my chantings. Ni un paso atrás, fuera. Ni un paso atrás, fuera. Which means not one step back. This was 2002 in Caracas, Venezuela, in the first oil strike opposition leaders organized to protest against the government. This picture was taken a couple of weeks ago. People still protesting in the same streets against the same government 17 years after that strike. If you happen to read the news, you've probably seen Venezuela in the headlines over the past months. Words like hyperinflation, crisis, unrest are fairly common. But what I see in this picture is larger than that. I see the hands of people I know, like my mom and my dad, that still live there. And more recently, I see hope. Hope of someday being able to come back to what I call home. With this talk, I want you to understand what is going on in Venezuela now. But I also want to show you the nation behind the news. I want to show you that despite the crisis, there is a strong social fabric being built in Venezuela that is worth standing for. But to do that, let's travel back in history for a bit. Recognize this face? This is Hugo Chavez. He was elected as president of Venezuela in 1999 with a populist proposal that came to change the traditional politics of what was one of the wealthiest countries in Latin America. He would stay in power for 14 years until he died. During that time, the price of an oil barrel multiplied by 10. And considering that we sit on top of the largest oil reserves in the world, you would expect Venezuela to become an even richer country. But no. Instead, the government increased our foreign debt, destroyed our internal production capacity, and fueled an overwhelming amount of corruption that left the country in misery. By 2013, the year Chavez died, I was graduating from the university, and I had spent my five years in college fighting against the government, all unsuccessful. New elections were scheduled, and Nicolas Maduro, announced by the government's propaganda as Chavez's son, was elected president. He would stay in power for six more years. Terrified, I left the country as part of one of the large migration waves, waves that fled Venezuela. Since then, oil prices plummeted, and years of mismanagement wrong public policies and no investment in infrastructure whatsoever came to a surface. Venezuela progressed towards one of the worst socioeconomic crises of our times. Please look at this graph. We are compared to Syria without actually being at war. Our annual inflation rate is estimated in somewhere between 1.6 million and 10 million percent. Can you imagine that? 90% of our population lives under the poverty line. Children have to scavenge for food in the streets. And babies are dying in hospitals because antibiotics are nowhere to be found. So what is happening now? By the beginning of this year, Maduro announced he would continue with his presidency, and he has the support of a few countries, like Russia, Cuba, 
and China. But this time, after years of fighting against a government, we are fighting for a government. Juan Guaidó is the president of the National Assembly. And he announced by the beginning of this year that would, he would be stepping in as interim president. I have to explain a bit better what, this, what all of this means. Years ago, we elected a National Assembly. We all voted for. And Maduro, last year, decided to strip away the power of this National Assembly and created a new one. It is as if President Trump decided to create a new Congress of Republicans because the one in power is fully Democrat. And even worse, this National Assembly called for presidential elections that were a fraud, and that's where Maduro won. So Juan Guaidó, the president of, of the National Assembly we had elected, is following articles in our Constitution and is legitimately announces his presidency. Immediately, millions of Venezuelans started supporting him. And that's the picture I showed in the beginning of the talk. Not only Venezuelans, we have the support of the international community. Over 60 countries have already legitimized his presidency, including the US, the European Union, and our neighbors, Colombia and Brazil. Now, don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of uncertainties, and I don't really know what will happen. But maybe, just maybe, this time we do change things, and a new government starts. For the first time in my life, I felt that coming back is a possibility, that the notion of rebuilding my country is actually not that far. And that is an amazing feeling to have. I need you to understand something about countries in crisis. There is never just one side to a story. That little girl that wandered the streets in Caracas did not grow up in this reality. The country I love is much more than this, that's. This is where my family lives. This is where I learned how to ride a bike. This is where I did the most mundane things, like watching the notebook with my best friend and crying silently over that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I can tell you something. I am not alone. I can proudly say that there are millions of Venezuelans that love our country and that are fighting now for a better future. Despite the daily struggles, regular civilians like you and me, are solving for the inefficiencies of a failed state. We are threading a social fabric fueled by creativity, innovation, and above all, resilience. As an example, if you hopped on a bus in Caracas today, you might catch the Bus TV. This is an initiative created by a group of young journalists that worried about the censorship of our national TV decided to ignite change, change themselves. And in a very simple yet effective way, they showcase the news to the lowest classes in Caracas. Like them, we have medical students that created a first aid group su to support in the violent protests. And we have hundreds of nonprofits that are increasing their mission to cover for basic needs. There's EPOSAC, for example, the one I work with that is originally focused in sustainable tourism, but is now reinventing itself to also provide energy to communities that desperately need it. This is what we Venezuelans are doing. But what can you do? Well, moving forward will require a lot of help from abroad. And there are a couple of ways you could be part of it. First, through humanitarian aid and donations. Second, through votes in favor of certain decisions in your own countries. And three, by leaving this room and sharing this message. Help me raise awareness. I hope that the next time that you read news about Venezuela or any other country in crisis, 
you're curious enough to go beyond the surface and look for the rebuilders. I can guarantee you'll be positively surprised. Thank you.